For millennia, people from different countries, cultures, and backgrounds have found direction and encouragement in the inspired pages of the Bible. In his day, Jesus directed listeners to search the prophecies of Scripture to find Him the only way of salvation. 2,000 years later, as we stand on the break of eternity, we no less need the purpose and hope God's Word provides. Sacramento Central Church brings you Receiving the Word, timely Bible messages presented by pastors Chris Buttery and Mike Thompson. Amazing revelations await you in God's Holy Word, the Bible. You have all these Old Testament uh, promises of the coming Messiah. But not only was the Messiah prophesied to come, there were particularized many aspects of his coming. The city where he was to be born, the heralding of the work of John the Baptist, his sojourn in Egypt when he was a child, the kind of ministry he would have, his betrayal, his death, his resurrection, all were graphically foretold in many minute details that only Christ could fulfill. You know, it wasn't enough for Christ to claim to be the Messiah. His credentials had to be proved in fulfilling the divine prophecies that he was indeed the Messiah. He is irrefutably the unerring fulfillment of all the messianic prophecies. Not one of them fails to fit his life and ministry. Can you say amen to that? Not one out of hundreds. Now, at the time Jesus came, the Messiah was one greatly longed for among the Jews. When he was born, there was this air of expectancy because of the teachings of the prophets, because of what the scriptures said. And so the Samaritan woman could say, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. And Andrew could come to Simon Peter with the mind-boggling announcement, we have found the Messiah. We've actually found him. We have found the Christ. And in the Sanhedrin, when Jesus was on trial, they said, if you are the Christ, tell us. You know, there's a story told of a woman who lived alone in the hills of the south. I'm not sure if this story happened during the Civil War or shortly after. Uh, but this woman, she was a very patriotic Southerner for the Confederacy, something that we don't look too fondly on now, of course. But she absolutely adored Robert E. Lee, the general of the Southern armies. And she had found pictures of him in various shops. And her living room walls had several pictures of Robert E. Lee. She had never met him, but he was her hero. One night, there was a terrible snowstorm. Those aren't too common in the South, but sometimes they happen. Two men knocked on the door that had been traveling, and they needed some temporary shelter because the storm had really gotten quite bitter. They were there for a while, and the storm ceased. And uh, when leaving, one of the men, very distinguished in appearance, gave the woman a little gift, and he stepped out the door. The woman looked at the other man and said, what, who is this distinguished and kind guest? Who is he? That man is General Robert E. Lee. Though she had his pictures all over her house, she did not recognize him when he came. The Messiah, there are pictures of the Messiah all through the Old Testament. And the prophecies are well known to every devout Jew yet most did not recognize and accept him as a Messiah when he came. How can that happen? How about us? Do we see Jesus? Do we recognize his hand in our lives? Do we know it's him that's there? You know, the whole idea that the Son of God came down and was this helpless little baby, you know, that's just... There's like hard, hard things to understand about that. How could the infinite, eternal Son of God become a little, helpless human baby? I'd like you to take your Bible and go to, go to Luke. I've referred to many, many Bible verses and given excerpts, but let's look at this one. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 30. The angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, 
for thou hast found thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. All right, so this is already an amazing thing because an angel's talking to her for one. Second, she's never been with a man and she's going to have a child conceived in her womb somehow. And she's given the name Jesus. And verse 32 says, he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. So she realized this is going to be the son of David. This is the promised Messiah because son of David was another expression for the Messiah. Verse 33 says, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom there shall be no end. And then Mary asks the question that I basically asked, how can the infinite eternal son of God become a helpless human baby? Verse 34, then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Wow. Now, this isn't explainable for humanity, is it? I mean, do you feel like you have a full understanding of exactly what God did to make that happen? I don't think so. Uh, but Mary just accepted it. Look at verse, th um, well, verse 37. It says, For with God nothing shall be impossible, whether we understand it or not. But Mary just accepted it. And verse 38 says, Mary said, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Very simple faith. So here we have the Son of God, born of a virgin, conceived by the Holy Spirit, but with chromosomes from a human mother who's damaged by sin. The mystery of God, huh? He's the son of Abraham. He's the son of David. He's the son of Mary. He really did become a man. Hebrews 2, verse 14 says, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So it says he had to become the flesh of a human being in order to defeat the devil and deliver us. Then verse 16 says, For verily he took not on, him, not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. He says, look, he didn't just come appearing as a man and was really an angel. Angels have unfallen natures. He said he, said he came um, through the seed of Abraham, through real humanity. And then verse 17 says, Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. And verse 18 says, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. So this is interesting because, you know, it says he had to be tempted in order to be our deliverer from temptation. Well, you know, Hebrews 4.15 says that he was tempted in all points like as we are, right? So that means he really was human. But it also says, yet yeah, it was, he was without sin. He never sinned. Not once. Not even the little slightest whisper of a sin. So if Jesus really took on human nature, how did he overcome all the temptations to which mankind is subjected? He must have had some special power, right? Well, Jesus denied that. John 5.30, Jesus said, I can of mine own self do nothing. And so Jesus is saying there, no matter what you see me do, no matter what temptations I've overcome, I never did it of myself. Why? Why? Because he took on the seed of Mary, or the seed of Abraham. He would had Mary's chromosomes, which were damaged by sin. So he said, I can of my own self do nothing. I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father, 
which has sent me. And there's a secret. This is why it is noted in the Gospels of Jesus seeking time to be with his father in prayer. His human nature was too weak to live the Christian life without divine aid. And so he sought his father in prayer because of his human nature and the need to live as any human would have to live. He relied on his father's help in order to overcome temptation and and to know what to do in his life. The prayer connection was absolutely needed. It was total surrender. I want you to see Jesus' words on this some more in the Gospel of John. Please turn with me to John chapter 10, the Gospel of John. Look at verse 36. Say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world. Who's he talking about? Himself. Say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world. That was Jesus. He says, thou blasphemest because I said I am the Son of God. He goes, you get all shook up because I say I'm the Son of God. Accuse me of blasphemy. And then verse 37 says, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. He says, if I'm not doing the same work of my Father in heaven, then you don't have to believe me. Verse 38 says, but if I do, he says, if I am doing the Father's works, if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. This is the key to victory for Jesus. It was that he was in the Father and the Father was in him. Peter wrote that Jesus left an example for us to follow. I'd like you to go to 1 Peter. See, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 and 22. Peter says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. So here's the big question. Sure, Jesus was our example. Sure, Jesus relied upon his father's divine aid to overcome temptation. Well, how does that example actually work out in our lives? Well, you remember what Jesus said in John 15 about the vine and the branches? Jesus said he was the vine and we are the branches and that we must abide in him and he in us. It's just like he was in the father and the father in him. He says, but you're in me and I'm in you. It's a total surrender to be in the abiding relationship with Jesus. Then we can have victory over temptation like Jesus. It's not in our strength, it's in his, as we are totally surrendered to him. Now, I just want to throw out a little aside here for a minute, because I want to say, of course, we have one really huge advantage over Jesus. How do we have a huge advantage over Jesus? Because when we fail to trust God and we blow it and we fall into sin, Jesus is our advocate and we can come to him in repentance and experience forgiveness and renewal. Jesus couldn't fail even one time. There was no savior for Jesus. There was no advocate for Jesus. There was no mediator for Jesus. He blew it once and the whole plan of salvation, him dying for our forgiveness, for our sins, everything would have fallen apart and we'd have no hope, no escape from the bondage of sin and death. Can you imagine having that burden on you as a human being? The whole human race depends on you? (laughs) Wow. But Jesus didn't fail. He was the perfect sacrifice for our sins. The Bible says that Christ died for our sins and rose again the third day. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, and that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And that when we are in Christ, we become a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things are become new. 1 Corinthians 5, 17. Paul Ratsara was a young boy on the island of Madagascar. Madagascar is in the Indian Ocean on the east side of the continent of Africa. Ancestor worship, medicine men, people putting curses on others and evil spirits, all that still had a place 
and his society there. Even though Western culture had brought in schools and a few elements of the modern age, there was still a lot of spirit worship going on. Paul's father was a chief, and he made a living as a cattle herder, as a farmer. Somehow, Paul, here he is as a teenager, somehow he has no idea where it came from. He found a New Testament with the Psalms in his house. And he would read while he was sitting in the fields watching the cattle. He had never heard anything about Christianity, really. And he started with the book of Matthew. And he read the story of the wise men who came and worshipped Jesus. Uh, Paul learned of sick people healed and demoniacs set free. The teachings of Jesus, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, captivated him. He loved the parables. He could relate so well to them. Parables, parables about sowers, about merchants, and the lost sheep. These parables fascinated him. And he spent a lot of time thinking about them, trying to understand their meaning. When he reached the last three chapters of the Gospel of Matthew, Paul's heart began to burn within him. He marveled at the love of Jesus who gave his life to save us from our sins. The response of his young heart was spontaneous and strong. He remembers sitting there on the ground, holding the Bible, thinking to himself, I love that man. I love that man. Day by day, Paul took this inspired treasure with him into the fields. He would inspect the cattle, and then when everything seemed good, he'd sit down and read more from the Holy Scriptures. He finally got all the way through the whole New Testament and the Psalms, and then he decided to go through it a second time, like a hungry man searching for bread. Jesus said, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. He read that, and he knew the promise of Jesus was true because it was being fulfilled in his own life. He could feel the hunger and thirst for righteousness and the filling coming. He said, Jesus keeps his word. Paul was 16 years old at that time. And he reflected back over the 16 years of his life. And several times his life had been spared. On one occasion, he had been caring for his family's cattle when an irritable bull attacked him. Fortunately, Paul was so skinny as a 12-year-old that when the bull hit him, the bull's horns went around either side of his waist but he was thrown violently to the ground. And then as he rolled and looked up to his horror, he saw the angry bull charging, ready to trample him to death. Who gave Paul the wisdom to just slide under a little bush? The bull seemed to lose track of him. Couldn't figure out where he went. And so he survived. Just bruises. Another time, he had been way up high in a tree and and he had lost his hold on, on this very high place. And he was falling head first, going to the ground. And just before striking the ground, his filling arms, somehow his hand had just hit a branch enough that it shifted his body as it was falling. And instead of landing on his head, he landed in a, a much better position. Not quite upright, but instead of death, he went away with just scratches and some really sore spots. And when he was 16, the same year he found the New Testament, he had been poisoned by an enemy. It's actually, they thought it was a jealous classmate because Paul had been the brightest student in his class. The medicine man couldn't help him. He ended up a whole month in the hospital and they couldn't save him. The doctors actually sent him home to die. Offerings to the spirits had been useless. He hadn't known at that time anything of the power of the living God. And just when it didn't seem like there was any possibility of him living more than a few more days or maybe a week, a former far, farm employee of his father just happened to come for a visit. Now, how did that man know the antidote to the poison when no one else did? And why did he come at just that time? Paul recovered. And now here he is thinking of all these things, sitting in his field, 
and he's reading about Jesus. He's sensing Jesus has been in his life and Paul knew he had been saved for a purpose. He was determined to go back to school. So eventually to go to a high enough quality high school, he moved to another town not too far away to live with his cousin and her husband so he could go to a, a better school. His cousin, he found, had a complete Bible, which Paul devoured day after day. He was thinking, oh, remember when Jesus was talking to the two on the road to Emmaus? He says he started at Moses and went through the prophets and the Psalms, explaining how these things would, would have to be. He says, now I can read what Jesus was talking about. And so he was working through the writings of Moses, and he was finding all the prophecies about Jesus. Paul began to get involved in a local Christian church. And people saw he had some natural leadership ability and it wasn't too long before they said, he knows his Bible well too. Um, they asked him to be the youth leader of that church. And then he became kind of a regional youth leader. He, he was helping with several churches. And then one day, a day that he will always remember Paul had a clear call from God to become a preacher. Well, he was excited about it, but he also was a little disappointed because preachers didn't make very much. And since his father was a chief and everything, he was expected to go to college. And he actually had wanted all along to go to engineering school. And so he was wrestling with the call to be a preacher. And in his country, at that engineering school, they could only accept 12 new students a year. Almost 2,000 took the test and applied. He decided to go for it. And what do you think happened? He was one of the 12. <laughs> so he enrolled in school, and he was so miserable that after a month, he came to one of the professors and said, I'm, I'm going to have to drop out and go home. The professor said, what are you, crazy? Thousands of people would love to take your place. And he told the professor, but God has called me to do something else. And so he finally yielded to the call of God. And when he made that decision and went home to his parents, they disowned him and kicked him out of the house. But he had committed and he went to a school for pastoral evangelism. A year later, he really missed his family. A year later, he took a chance and went home to see how things were. His parents had missed him so much, they apologized. His father asked Paul to study the Bible with him. Later, Paul was serving as a district pastor in um, the war-torn country of Zaire. Now it's called the Democratic Republic of Congo. On one occasion, bandits kidnapped him. One of his fellow pastors had been shot to death by bandits just three days earlier. And now they're driving off in a vehicle with Paul as their captive and a gunman on one side, a gunman on the other side, both pointing their guns at him. They told him that they were going to kill him. Of course, they took his wallet, they took his papers. They told him they were going to kill him in a quiet spot, spot along the banks of the Congo River and that they were going to dump him in the river and no one would ever know what became of him. Well, as they're riding in the car, Paul was claiming Bible promises like Psalm 50, 15. This is a great time to you know, be happy about all the Bible verses he remembered. You memorize and he, this one says, call me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will honor me. And so Paul claimed that promise. In spite of guns pointing at him on both sides as they rode along in the car and knowing their intentions to kill him, Paul felt himself filled with a deep and abiding peace. It was actually the same peace that he had felt reading the Gospel of Matthew in the field while tending his father's cattle years before. The exact same peace. Paul surrendered his life to, to Jesus, and he said, I felt Jesus right by my side there in the car. And he prayed to, to, to God. He says, if it's my time to die, I'm in your hands. 
He said, I was not afraid. I felt no fear at all. And then with this perfect peace, I guess he got a little bold. He spoke to the gunmen, gunmen, explaining that he was a missionary from Madagascar, serving God in humanity. And he says, I even came here for you. And they tried not to listen to him. And then they arrived at, uh, finally they arrived at the river and all the bandits began arguing with each other in a language he didn't understand. And finally the leader spoke out in French and he knew French. The leader spoke out and told the others that Paul was a man of God. He said, we're going to let him go. Well, they stopped. He said, you can go. Instead of getting out of the car and running for his life, Paul felt such perfect peace that he asked if they would give him a ride back. Can you imagine that? Was that foolish? Was that reckless? Or was his boldness compelling evidence that Jesus is real, a provider of perfect peace, the true Messiah? Well, the bandits kept arguing as they drove back toward town. The leader wanted to return Paul's papers and his wallet, but the others argued with him. They finally came to a place where they decided to drop Paul off and they returned all his things. So Paul said, okay, now we are friends. God bless you. And then the bandit gave him advice of what roads to avoid so they wouldn't get picked up by other bandits. He was really helpful. So God spared Paul and he eventually became the division president of the Africa Indian Ocean Division. And his son was a fellow pastor of mine in Michigan when I was there. Paul has always felt the meaning and purpose of his life is solely because he got to know Jesus. That Jesus is the way to eternal life. That Jesus is the way to eternal peace. Jesus is the way to eternal joy. Yes, God the Son, Jesus, everything hinges on him. It always comes back to him. Who can cheer the heart like Jesus? Who can supply our needs like Jesus? Who else could be our all in all? Jesus is the fairest of all, the most amazing of them all. Will you not trust him with your life? Where you are, would you just say, Jesus, I trust you with my whole life. Everything hinges on you. I give my life to you. Would you just say that to Jesus where you are quietly? We're so glad you decided to tune in to today's Receiving the Word program. If you have a special prayer request, we would be happy to pray about it for you. To discover more about the Bible through our free online Bible studies or to listen to more life-changing Bible messages, go to sacentral.org and click on the Media Resources tab. If you've been blessed or encouraged by our ministry and God impresses you to support us, then visit our website or write to us at 6045 Camellia Avenue, Sacramento, California, 95819. Always gladly receive God's Word.